Um, Andy is a freelance writer, academic lecturer, and folk musician living in Oxford, UK. He lectures regularly at Oxford Brookes University on subjects as diverse as neo-paganism, shamanism, and the theory and study of religion. He is the author of the critically acclaimed Shrooms, A Cultural History of the Magic Mushroom, and Mad Thoughts on Mushrooms, Discourse and Power in the Study of Psychedelic Consciousness, published in the Journal of Anthropology of Consciousness. Known for his iconoclastic style and with doctorates in both ecology and the study of religion, he challenges us to question received wisdom about psychedelics and psychedelic history. A prolific songwriter, tunesmith, and exponent of English bagpipes, he fronts the psych psychedelic folk band Telling the Bees. So I'll turn you over to Andy now. Thank you all for coming. Hello, is this on? Um, well, I thought I'd begin by just saying a big thank you to uh, the organizers of Horizons for inviting me. Uh, Neil tried to get me over here last year and I prevaricated and I said, well, you know, it's a long way to go for a weekend. And, uh, well, we let it go. And then in January of this year, he, uh, he tried again, and his, uh, his arm twisting was a little bit more successful. And uh, New York is a great city, and this is a great conference, and I'm having a great time, and I really don't want to go home tomorrow. So thank you. Um, I thought I should start, really, by introducing myself. Um, I've written this book but it's appeared out of the blue, you don't know me from Adam. I'm in the bizarre position of having two PhDs. It's ridiculous, I know. Uh, uh, some people say I'm too clever by half, ha ha. Um, I started off wanting to be an ecologist, and I did a PhD in ecology at Oxford University, which I hated. And I then became very involved in environmental direct action. I lived in tree houses and put myself in the way of construction machinery. And as a result of doing this, I got invited, yes, invited, to do a second PhD um, in the study of religion. And as I didn't have any income and I didn't know what I was doing, um, I'm not stupid, it was three years of uh, a living. So I did it, and I found that I actually quite enjoyed it. So I've got PhDs coming out of my ears, um, I'm also a folk musician, and uh, I play in a band called Telling the Bees. Um, there's a whole kind of folk revival going on in the UK at the moment, as I think there is in America, with people like uh, Devendra Banhart and uh, Joanna Newsom and that whole West Coast scene. And I also play uh, English bagpipes. There's a, a scene in England at the moment where people are trying to rediscover what an indigenous trance music would be. This is, if you like, the, um, the implicit uh, uh, kind of thing that people are trying to do. So I play bagpipes with a hurdy-gurdy player, and we play for dancing, we play for French and Breton dancing, and when it works, something definitely happens. We play for three or four hours, and uh, it doesn't matter if the electricity goes off, we can still keep playing. So that's what I do. Um, I'm also uh, a psychedelic insider. I'm going to say more about that in a bit. But what I'm interested in and what interests me is applying all this theory that I've learned in the academy, some critical thinking to psychedelic culture. This is uh, a potentially risky path to take. It may mean that some of our treasured beliefs uh, don't look so strong when we've uh, examined them critically. But my hope is that psychedelic thinking will be the stronger as a result of it. And I would like to see uh, the whole matter of psychedelics and psychedelic religion uh, discussed within the academy. So just as there are queer theorists, maybe we need psychedelic theorists in the academy. That's my aim. So the question that interests me is what happens when we take a psychedelic drug? I'm being a scientist, half a scientist by training. I am, of course, interested in 
what psilocybin does to the brain and all the stuff that uh, Franz Vollenweide was talking about yesterday. However, I'm much more interested in the phenomenology of tripping. What does it feel like on the inside? Uh, are our experiences true or valid? Should we trust them? Contemporary culture is uh, very far from psychedelic. Uh, sorry, I meant to start my watch. There we go. There's a, there's a, I think this is an urban myth, and you encounter it time and time again. You hear the story that when people uh, drop LSD, they think they can fly, and they jump out of tall buildings. Uh, a couple of years ago, or a year, a year ago, uh, mushroom, uh, psilocybin mushrooms, the sale of them was banned in Amsterdam. And the catalyst for this was that a French student, uh, I believe she did commit suicide, or she certainly attempted to commit suicide, by jumping off a bridge in Amsterdam after taking mushrooms. Well, that's what one paper said. Another paper said she jumped out of a building. It turns out she had psychiatric problems. But what the press did was fit this incident into the urban myth that when you take a psychedelic, you are so deranged that you think you can fly and you jump out of the window. So uh, mainstream culture says that psychedelics derange you. They impair you, the normal functioning of the brain. They are of no value. And that's quite a powerful discourse. That's what we're up against. That's what we have to work against. When we take psychedelic drugs, we have extraordinary experiences. And yesterday, Bill uh, talked about uh, William James and his fourfold typology of mystical experiences uh, in his classic book, The Varieties of Re Religious Experience, which, um, if you haven't read cover to cover, it always gets quoted, the chapter on psychedelics. You've got to read it from cover to cover. It is a beautifully written, elegantly argued book. And according to William James, there are four characteristics of a mystical experience. It's noetic, that is, you feel like you are receiving information or knowledge that you didn't have previously. It's transient, it doesn't last forever. It's passive, it feels like it's happening to you, not a product of yourself. And also that it is ineffable, you cannot put it into words. I think we'd all agree with that, would we not? What are we doing here? We're talking about drugs. So this ineffable experience that we have, immediately we render and we make it effable. We say, we can't talk about this, and we talk about it. This is interesting, because as soon as we talk about it, uh, we have to use language, and language is culturally bound. When I finished writing Shroom, I was left with a problem, with a question. If you look at uh, what Terence McKenna, peace be upon him, says about the mushroom experience, the language he uses is the language of science fiction, of aliens, of consciousness. If you look at uh, what Maria Sabina allegedly said, she uses the language of uh, spirits, uh, clowns, elf clowns. This is exactly what you would expect from someone who'd grown up in an animistic culture, just as you would expect someone who grew up in 1950s America reading Marvel comics and geekily enjoying science fiction, that their imagination would uh, use the language of science fiction. So, the way we speak about psychedelic experiences is culturally bound. In other words, the way we write and the way we speak about mushrooms becomes of critical importance. But there's another problem with this. What if, what if mushrooms don't produce transcendence after all? What if they just simply rearrange the contents of our consciousness 
and unconscious in meaningful and interesting ways? What if the psychedelic experience is always bounded by culture? Now, that's not uh, a position I want to believe, but it may be the case. We have to entertain the idea. I don't have an answer to this, and I suspect it is an unanswerable question. But uh, what, in the work I'm working on at the moment, I am trying to attempt an, uh, an answer. How far can philosophy take us? How far can critical thinking take us towards answering this question? And uh, as I say, I'm not going to answer that now, but I am going to just say that uh, the direction I'm taking is to use hermeneutics, which is um, the philosophy and art of interpretation. Uh, you don't know this, but you are all hermeneuticists. If you don't know what hermeneutics is, I don't blame you. It took me years to try and work out what on earth they were going on about. Hermeneutics is the art of interpretation. It's usually used in theology. Um, have you all seen Monty Python's The Life of Brian? Yeah? You know the scene where Brian says, now will you please all fuck off? And uh, John Cleese turns around and says, Sire, how would you like us to fuck off? He's being a hermeneuticist. When you have a, a text like the Bible, there are millions of ways you could interpret the message. So hermeneutics uh, has been used a lot in theology. Apologies for swearing in a church. I'm sure I'll be forgiven. Or not. Uh, and when we take a psychedelic drug, we are constantly interpreting the experience. And then when we talk about it, or when we represent it in art, we are making an interpretation, a culturally bound interpretation. Here's a postcard that I picked up in Glastonbury, which, if you don't know, is uh, the New Age capital of Britain. Uh, it's showing people picking mushrooms on a October Autumn morning, uh, we will be out in the fields very soon. It's a joke, of course. Hopefully you get the joke. Uh, there may be some translation issues between British English and American English. I hope not. But it, I suspect if you were a group of indigenous mushroom users, you might not get the joke. In other words, this, I'm showing you this because mushroom use is culturally bound. Here's an album cover from a band, a now defunct, a space rock band, festival space rock band called the Magic Mushroom Band, called Boom Shankar. They weren't very good. They were all right. Here, uh, the uh, taking psychedelics is immediately bound up with a countercultural identity. So if you take psychedelics, you are expected to be anti-authority, etc., etc. There's no reason why that should be the case. Uh, the way we frame and talk about our mushroom experiences or psychedelic experiences are always culturally bound. I should say at this point, uh, I'm talking about mushrooms because I'm not a psychonaut. Uh, mushrooms uh, are the plant with which I work. Uh, uh, the, the framework, the context, if you like, for my psychedelic use is paganism. I'm interested in mushrooms because I can go out and pick them. Uh, discreetly, out of the view of people, I can go to beautiful parts of the British countryside, pick them and consume them. I'm interested in a plant that is of the land and connects me to the land. So I apologize for the mushroom bias, but that's what I do. So, um, yeah, the point I want you to come away with is simply this that we all make interpretations of our psychedelic experiences. But those experiences are not constant through time. They change through time. Different people in different cultures at different times interpret the experience differently. Across the 20th century, we've seen people go from interpreting the mushroom experience as one of being poisoned and therefore one that is of no use at all, to uh, a psychedelic discourse, generally the language of mysticism. And then in the last 10, 15 years or so, we've been seeing people interpret them through the language of shamanism, 
So it just in the last hundred years, the language, the framework with which we have interpreted our mushroom experiences has changed. There is still a medical term for mushroom poisoning. It's called mycetismus cerebralis. It has been medicalized. So if you go into uh, your hospital having a bad trip, I don't know if people, medics still use that designation, but it's in the book. It's seen as an illness. By contrast, the shamanistic model sees mushrooms as enabling people to get well. So that's just changed in the last hundred years. So I've written this book called Shroom. It came out three years ago, though I do look about 12 in the picture. It's fair to say it's met mild indifference in cynical, jaded Britain. Uh, in America, it's been a little bit more divisive. Uh, there are those people who love it. There are those people who hate it. And I get fan mail and I get hate mail. It's quite interesting. I didn't make this explicit in the book, but it's obvious for anyone with eyes to see that I am an insider, and that there are times when I describe friends say dot, 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 or uh, enthusiasts say dot, 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 that I am talking about myself. And here I am really looking about 12 on the beach in Cornwall with one of my first mushroom trips. Bless. I wanted to um, write a book. It's an Shroom is an academic book, masquerading as a popular read. And what I wanted to do was write a book that academics had to take seriously. It bothers me that in contemporary culture, if you stand up and say, I take magic mushrooms, they are an important part of my spiritual life or my uh, quest for meaning, you will be immediately branded as being infantile or escapist or off with the fairies, not to be taken seriously. What I would like to do is uh, contribute to a debate in which mushrooms and mushroom use are taken seriously. I think that uh, what we can gain from taking psychedelics is important and has genuine value. So that's why I wrote it. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and here's a picture of an academic taking drugs in the Amazon, purely for comic effect. Yeah, I wanted to remove the, uh, the Dan Brown elements from the history of magic mushrooms. I don't know if any of you went to the, um, the Albert Hoffman 100th birthday conference in Basel. Uh, it was a great conference, but I came away thinking, if I hear the story of how Albert Hoffman accidentally discovered LSD and had his bicycle ride one more time, I will go mad. It's not that it's not true. It happened. Those events happened. But they have become mythology. These are sacred stories now that we tell and retell. And every time we retell them, the truth just gets a little bit further away from us. The same is true of uh, the history of magic mushrooms. In the book, I devote a whole section to the history of the fly agaric mushroom. I'm not going to say anything about that today. Um, but I will debunk one myth for you. Uh, many of you may believe that Santa Claus is, in fact, a fly agaric mushroom shaman. I'm afraid not. Uh, there's absolutely no evidence for this. Uh, certainly not in Siberia. It was the romantic imagination of the poet Robert Graves who never let, her, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. These are psilocybe cubensis mushrooms, which I believe are uh, the mushroom of choice on this side of the pond uh, because they're easy to cultivate. Uh, these are the liberty caps, which grow in great profusion in upland areas of Britain, uh, you're never more than an hour's drive away from a good mushroom field. They'll just be, uh, depending on whether it's got cold and wet since we left, they'll be coming up now. There is, I'm afraid to say, 
no trace of a psilocybin mushroom occurring in the archaeological record of Britain and Europe. I don't know about America, and I don't know whether that has changed in the three years since Shroom was published. However, you wouldn't expect mushrooms to appear. They rot within hours of appearing. So what people have done is they have assumed, they have made the assumption that mushrooms were used, and then they have tried to find evidence to prove that this was the case. This is a very old-fashioned way of doing historical scholarship. It fell out of favor by at least 1920. Now what historians do is they look at the evidence and they try and uh, interpret it with possibly many theories. One way that people, uh, mushroom enthusiasts, have tried to uh, prove that mushrooms were, uh, were used is to look for mushroom iconography. The idea is that anything that looks like a mushroom is a mushroom, or was a mushroom, is a psychedelic mushroom, and implies religious usage. These are all large inductive leaps. Here is a photo of a mushroom-looking thing. I took it in America at the Telluride Mushroom Festival. It's a road sign. But, you know, there's a certain similarity. OK, this is easy to debunk. No one, I think, in their right mind would try and argue that uh, the, uh, the, I don't know, is, do you have a core? who mend your roads? Are they secretly engaged in a psychedelic mushroom cult as they dig through the tarmac? I don't think anyone in their right mind would argue that. Now, what about this image? Uh, are you all familiar with this image? Have you seen it before? You'll see it on the internet. This is a, an image of a piece of rock art, prehistoric rock art from Algeria in North Africa, uh, from the Tassili Plateau, where there was prolific amounts of rock art stretching back to the Neolithic period. I can assure you that this image does portray uh, a mushroom shaman in the full ecstasy of a mushroom experience. I can assure you that because this was drawn by Kat Harrison, Terence McKenna's ex-wife, and she told me, But this is not the original. This is a copy. I think she must have traced the image. This is the original from the book from which she got the image. OK, the differences aren't substantial. However, the psychedelic swirls between the legs aren't quite so clear. It's not quite so clear that those are feathers sprouting from this creature's head. And are they mushrooms? Here's another piece of art from the same region, apparently depicting the same figure. Where are the mushrooms? If the mushrooms in this previous picture were the most important thing, why are they missing in this one? Nobody has had much to say about this piece of art from the same region, which seems to show mushrooms sprouting from a woman's ass. I shall translate seem to show mushrooms sprouting from a woman's ass. Is that right? Did I get that right? Maybe they're not mushrooms at all. Maybe they, they have scatological significance or sexual significance. Maybe they, uh, some people have interpreted the figure as a bee figure. Maybe they represent venom or bee stings. Maybe they represent power. Maybe they represent something we have no idea what it is that was so culturally specific to the people that drew these pictures, they didn't need to explain what they were. The mushroom hypothesis may be true. We don't know. There may be other equally valid explanations that have nothing to do with mushrooms. What we need to do, what someone needs to do, is to go to Tassili and record every single one of those images and look at the context. You can't just strip this data out of its context and expect it to be true. This is another image from the same area. I grant you it's more, uh, uh, it looks 
more convincing to us. We just want these creatures to be mushroom, pixie elves rushing through silo space with their pixie liberty caps. Yeah? Well, it took my partner, who's an artist, to point out that these arrow-shaped things in the creature's hands don't look anything like real mushrooms. That squiggle is for us a culturally agreed representation of a mushroom. If you're an artist and drawing a mushroom, it doesn't look like that. We've put it in cross section. So to us, that sign immediately says mushroom. And it's very difficult for us to step out of that belief system and imagine ourselves as Neolithic people in North Africa for whom that sign could mean anything. Not everything that has a mushroom-shaped cap is a mushroom. This is a, a, an image from a medieval manuscript of some fools wearing fool's caps. They look a bit like mushrooms, but uh, uh, only the um, credulous, to put it politely, would say that they represent uh, the last lingering traces of a medieval mushroom cult. So we have to be really careful. It's very easy for us to back project onto history our wishful thinking. OK, so moving on to uh, Europe. There are, well, I found several examples of accidental magic mushroom ingestion. I can't prove that's what happened. They didn't have any concept for magic mushrooms in the time, at the time. But in every example, people thought they had been poisoned. So there's a wonderful story of a, a, a hard-up family in London, the Bickerton family. In 1830, they turn up in the history books tripping their bollocks off in Westminster Hospital. And this young doctor, uh, I forget his name, he comes in to treat them, and there they are rolling around on the floor, giggling with tears pouring down their face, and uh, he thinks they're just drunk, and he refuses to treat them. Well, he smells their breath, and he realizes they're not drunk. And what they'd done, they'd gone out in the morning to Hyde Park, and they'd picked every single mushroom they found, and they tried selling them to the poor, unsuspecting folk of London. Uh, as luck would have it, they didn't manage to sell a single punnet of mushrooms. If they had, they would have been responsible for the single largest outbreak of magic mushroom poisoning in history. So they went home and they necked the lot, something like two quarts worth of mushrooms. Bear in mind, they probably weren't all magic mushrooms. In those days, people thought all uh, fungi were the same. They were all mushrooms, but the bad ones were toadstools. And they devised all these very uh, bizarre and ineffectual ways of distinguishing mushrooms from toadstools, none of which work. So if you go out mushroom picking on a November morning and you eat your mushrooms for breakfast and something weird starts happening, you would immediately think, oh shit, I've been poisoned. Set and setting, what's likely to happen? You're not going to have a good time. Um, this poor family ended up having their stomachs pumped and to add insult to injury, uh, the doctor then proceeded to put leeches on them. Uh, to suck out the poison. Can you imagine having leeches put on you while you're tripping? <laughs> this is an image from the Graphic magazine of 1873. This is the earliest Western representation of a magic mushroom trip. It shows someone having a horrible time being poisoned. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time, so uh, I really can't... Uh, give you the complete summary of shroom that I'd like. But uh, these are some stills from a film made by the BBC in about 1960, telling the story of how Gordon Wasson went to Mexico and rediscovered magic mushroom. Uh, the film sadly doesn't exist anymore, or if anyone has a copy, I'd love to see it. But these stills exist in the Gordon Wasson archive at Harvard. Uh, I spent a very happy week going through this treasure trove. It's an amazing uh, uh, 
gold mine. But what an amazing picture. It completely summarizes in uh, one, two, three, six, six, six film strips the rediscovery of the magic mushroom. Uh, Middle America is the one place where with certainty we can say magic mushroom use, intentional magic mushroom use, goes back to at least of the time of the conquest, probably a lot longer. The Aztecs were possibly the most psychedelic culture that has existed before us. Gordon Wasson, the banker with J.P. Morgan, fancied himself as a bit of a scholar, anthropologist, went off to Mexico convinced by his theory that magic mushrooms lay at the root of religion. Not a religion, religion, capital R. The religious impulse in humanity was triggered by a global magic mushroom cult. So he went with that idea. He found a few curanderos. He wasn't very impressed with them. And then he found Maria Sabina, the uh, indigenous curandera. And he thought he'd found the real deal. He thought she was the last living priestess of his religion. And he took the mushrooms back, diddly D, and Albert Hoffman synthesized them, and there it is. And so this kind of summarizes the way the West has translated the mushroom experience here. Here, it's gone from a shamanistic discourse to a science discourse on the other side. We've in reinterpreted the mushroom experience. Uh, and this is one of Alan Moore's iconic pictures of Ma Maria Sabina. I argue very strongly in the book. I'm very critical of Gordon Wasson. I'm sure he was a lovely man, an amazing man, a charismatic man, a generous man, a loyal man. But he was a terrible anthropologist. And he completely misrepresented Maria Sabina. She was one of many curanderas. Um, there was nothing particularly amazing about her. I'm sure she, too, was an amazing person as well. But there was nothing out of the ordinary about her. And as a result of Wasson pop, uh, publicizing his discoveries, her life was dramatically changed in uh, ways that were detrimental to her. She got arrested, accused of dealing cannabis. Jealous locals burnt her house down. This is not how you do ethnography. This is not how you do anthropology. So here, in this photo, sure, she looks like the divinely inspired priestess. But here's a photo I found in the archive. Who knew that Maria Sabina played guitar? Who knew that she had a vinyl collection? What did she listen to? Was she into Hendrix or the Beatles? Or did she listen to wall-to-wall -wall mariachi bands? We don't know. She was a Mexican peasant. She was part of her culture. She wasn't this noble savage. She uh, has been misrepresented. And sadly, uh, her words have been interpreted by a Mexican translator. And until her, um, her exact words are retranslated as she spoke them, it was Octavio Paz who looked at it and said, no, 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 she doesn't sound primitive enough. So the published uh, sayings and poetry and, and mushroom-inspired songs of Maria Sabina are an interpretation. They are not her exact words. She's been made into this noble savage. Just to wind up, really, um, there's so much I could say about Terence McKenna. Um, I'm still a great Terence McKenna fan. He had a huge influence on my life. Uh, not many of his ideas stand up to serious critical inquiry. I know there's a big 2012 bubble building up. Um, if you like, you can ask me why I'm not a 2012 fan in the questions. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say any more about that now. I think McKenna did two important things for psychedelic culture. One, he elevated the status of the magic mushroom from LSD's poor cousin um, to a uh, psychedelic experience of value in itself. And the other is that he learned how to cultivate cubensis. So in effect, he is responsible for the worldwide magic mushroom boom. Uh, which is now over because the law has changed. But certainly a few years ago, mushrooms were widely on sale all across Britain and, we had, and in Amsterdam, in Holland. 
And just to finish, as I say, ours is the most psychedelic culture, I think, that there has ever been on this planet. We have access to more uh, plentiful drugs than ever before. It's an interesting question, why us? We're still up against a dominant discourse that says these things have no intrinsic value. And I applaud the efforts of everyone who's involved in the science side of things and the therapy side of things, trying to, make, trying to challenge that discourse on scientific terms. What I would say to you is that it's very tempting to want to justify what we do by inventing an imaginary history that uh, stretches back to prehistorical times. It's very tempting. It's happened in modern paganism. We don't need to do that. It undermines our case if we make up histories of aliens and UFOs and diddly d. We need to look at the facts. We need to look at the evidence. Within that, there is a great space with which to dream. It may very well be the case that people have been using magic mushrooms intentionally since the year dot. We need to find evidence that that is the case. Um, I, I would love that evidence to appear. In the meantime, there's enough gaps in the evidence for us to dream. But what we really need to do is tackle that discourse that says they have no value on its own terms. And that is where I'll leave it. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Okay, you can see why we invited him. Um, so we've got uh, about 10 minutes or so for questions and comments. Uh, would anybody like to uh, share and talk? Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, so I understand why you'd like to see more uh, rigorous academic discourse in, on psychedelics, but I wonder if the Terence McKenna and 2012 kind of uh, cultures that are constructing new mythologies aren't also worth looking at through that same rigorous academic discourse as valid expressions of new religious movements rather than necessarily debunking them, as you mentioned. Uh, sure. Well, it depends which side of the inside or outsider debate you want to stand. Um, as an academic scholar of religion, of course, it's interesting. Um, but I'm an insider, so I'm speaking today really as an insider. And... Okay, I have two principal objections to the whole 2012 thing. The first, and you're not going to like this, um, to me it smacks of Judeo-Christian millenarianism. It's just another millenarian cult, end of the world, apocalyptic cult. And I'm a pagan. I want to kind of get away from that discourse, you know? I'm more into circles than straight lines. Um, so, uh, potentially, from an outside point of view, it just looks like it's, it's part of the same dominant discourse, religious discourse. My second objection is philosophical. The whole 2012 thing is uh, teleological. It's a finalist viewpoint. It's the idea that everything... Uh, I think Terence McKenna called it the big surprise. Everything is like water falling down a plug hole. We're all being swept down to this singularity, to this event horizon that is uh, just drawing us down. Well, great, but where does that leave free will? Why, if, if it's going to happen anyway, what difference does it make if I take psychedelics or not? What difference does it make if I meditate or not? Maybe I can just carry on consuming and uh, burying my head in the sand and ignoring it. What, why do you have to be, or is it just that it's going to be the psychedelic chosen who get through this portal? So there's a philosophical problem in that it leaves no space for free will. Interestingly, this was pointed out by Henri Bergson in about 1914. So uh, uh, I, I think we're heading for a really bumpy ride with climate change. I really do. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I, think, uh, I think, you know, we're, we're heading for difficult times. But I think 2012 is, is a distraction. And my prediction for 2012 is that as we get closer, there'll be people writing books saying, 
It's not 2012, it's 2030. It's 2034, there'll be a get out clause and everyone will go, well, yes, we just got our calculations wrong. Um, that said, uh, I think December the 22nd or is it the 21st is gonna be an interesting night and uh, it's a damn shame Terence McKenna isn't still with us because I wanted to be at his party. <laughs> Other, um, anybody else want to share with the group? Ask a question? Oh, come on. Parry, okay. I'm curious about the role that uh, mushrooms play in your neo-pagan spiritual practice. I'm also neo-pagan and uh, would like to hear about how it's used in, in Britain. Also, if there are any festivals that you regard as noteworthy uh, neo-pagan festivals there. Um, okay, so, uh, sorry, I didn't hear all of that. You want to know my own personal usage and what the culture is in Britain? Yes, and like here we have the Starwood Festival and a number of others that, that stand out among the festivals that happen here, and I'm wondering what their closest equivalents in, in Britain are. Okay, they, I'm unaware of any mushroom festivals in Britain. There certainly used to be in the, in the 1970s um, in Wales. Um, since the law changed, people uh, have to be a little bit more discreet. Um, Ah, my own usage. Let's say I started off in my teens when I got to university. Uh, it, I decided I was going to be a hippie, okay? And what do you have to do to be a hippie? You have to smoke dope and you have to take psychedelics. There you go. So my uh, initial usage was uh, recreational, but it was also about identity, wanting to identify with a su subculture. And over the years, uh, my usage has changed, and um, I hesitate to use the word spiritual because I don't know what it means anymore, but it's certainly something that I do in very particular contexts. So, for example, um, I always take them outdoors, uh, somewhere where I'm not going to be uh, disturbed by people. Um, one mushroom party I had was raided by not only the police, but a police helicopter. That was an interesting night. Um, we were talking about bad trips yesterday. That was a challenging one. Um, I, I try and avoid that these days. I, I had this awful moment of realization. We were playing music around the fire. It was just getting going. We were just, you know, it was just cooking. And suddenly this police helicopter came spiraling over our woodland and hovered over us for eternity <laughs> and I realized this is my party I'm responsible here <laughs> and so uh, I, I walked out into a clearing and uh, with I was playing this reed instrument this reed pipe in a very Gandalf fashion it became my my wand and I stood there <laughs> as this helicopter swept over and the spotlight came on me and I was <laughs> they must have been going oh fuck what's What's going on down there? I try and avoid that now. Um, so um, I have a group of friends. We meet up at the summer solstice near Avebury Stone Circle. We have a fire. We consume mushrooms. We make music. Um, this was a question that came up in the panel yesterday, actually, about music and what music people listen to uh, whilst tripping. I would urge you to make music while you're tripping. We, uh, in the West, we divorce music making from consuming music. And uh, I've been around circles where people are literally banging two sticks together. And in some intangible way that I, I can't explain, it feels very important to be making music whilst tripping. Um, I could say a lot more. Uh, th there was a whole kind of psychedelic subculture to environmental direct action. Uh, it called itself Tribadelica. Um, I intend to write about it because it's not very well known, but it involved basically going to ancient sites like Iron Age hill forts, stone circles, and trying to connect with the genius loci, the spirit of the place, through psychedelics and music. And I can say a lot more, but I think I'll leave it hanging. Other questions? Um, Franz. Um, I was wondering what's the uh, foundation of your argument for the free will 
like given that science has not much left much space for f uh, free will. And is it a, an ontological argument or? Um, the question was, uh, did I hear What's that the right? Foundation of the foundation made, of free will. You made a statement that free will would be an argument. Um, there's no much, not much space for free will. In science? In science, yes. Um, can I get back to you on that in about 10 years' time? Uh, I'm, this I is work love, in progress, yes. okay? Uh, yeah, I, d I wish I could give you a brilliant philosophical answer, which I, I don't uh, have yet. I'm, I'm still, <laughs> still feeling my way through this. But um, at the moment, I'm very inspired by Henri Bergson, the philosopher. I'm only beginning my study of him. But he sees finalism as materialism turned upside down. So I think what you're saying is that in science, if we had a computer big enough and we knew all the initial starting points, we could predict everything that was going to happen. Is that what you're saying? That it's all ultimately deterministic? Yes, but science has a gap. If you put in probabilistic uh, developments, not deterministic. Um, well, I, as I say, I don't have the answer, but okay. Bergson is trying to carve out this philosophical space between <laughs> determinism and finalism. Okay. Uh, I'll get back to you. Yes. That's the book after the next one. Uh, another question? Anyone? Okay, okay. Okay. I was recently very surprised when I added Syrian rue to psilocybin. Uh, do you have anything to say about the either cautions or suggestions of things that can be mixed with mushrooms? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear that. The acoustics in here are very strange. In I help close it, hold it a little closer. I was very surprised at the result of adding Syrian rue to psilocybin. And I wondered if you had any comments about the dangers or suggestions about things that can be mixed with mushrooms. Um, not really. I'm, uh, I'm not a psychonaut. I, for me, it's not about going to the candy store and saying, I'll have a bit of this and I'll have a bit of that. And what happens if I mix it with a bit of this and then try some nitrous and stick my head in a bucket and... <laughs> For me, it's about uh, a, r a relationship with a plant. Uh, going picking mushrooms is, to me, more important, well, as important as consuming them. And uh, because it's, it's like the peyote hunt, you know, you're finding this, this thing, you have to go out looking for it. Um, I know people make all kinds of drug cocktails and Good luck to them. That's, that's not what I choose to do, so I don't really have a comment. We have to uh, thank Andy, please, uh, once again. <laughs>